Good morning, family. Good morning. <clears throat> Praise the Lord for the day that he has made. It's a good day, right? Amen. We get to gather. We get to worship freely. We get to praise his name. We get to honor him and, uh, for the life that he's given us, for salvation, for what he's doing in our lives. It's just a blessing to be here with you this morning. And as we get ready to dive in today, I want to start with taking a look at the book of Judges. So pre-book, pre-mark your Bibles if you have them. We're going to be in Judges chapter 3 for a minute, and then we're going to be in 13, 14, 15, and 16. So don't get nervous. I'm not going to stand up here and read all four chapters. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I'm going to let you read them to me. Uh, just, just joking. In all seriousness, I really want to take a, do is take a snapshot, if you will, of some of the highs and the lows of Samson's life as lessons for us today. And, and you may be asking, why do we look at Old Testament, the Old Testament for lessons? Why do we look to the Old Testament for examples? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 12, that, and this is in the message, so it reads a little strong. It says, these are all warning markers, danger, in our history books, written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They are at the beginning and we are at the end. And we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You are not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easily as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It is useless. Cultivate God confidence. So Paul says clearly that these things were written for us as examples. So in other words, when we read the stories in the Old Testament, they're not just good stories. They're not just cool stories about what they did in times past. These are lessons. They're helpful. They're useful for us as we learn to walk in the newness of life that Christ has given us. They're, they help us to grow and they help us to mature. These history lessons from the Old Testament lead us and guide us away from the same pitfalls that we face as they did. You see, uh, they also take us to the mountaintops of victory over our sin. Amen? So they give us an insight into both, how not to and how to. To be sure of this, family, there is always a lesson for us when we crack open this book. When we open this book, there is, God has something to say to us. And He's not just wanting to, to make us feel good. He's not just wanting to make us happy. He has a lesson. I guess the question is, are we listening? Because we're learning every day in every circumstance. Have you ever seen someone behaving rudely or badly and you say, Whoa, I am not going to be like that. You just learned in the negative. Because that person's negative behavior just taught you a lesson on how not to be in life. It works the same way in the positive. We see someone being a blessing and an encourager or blessing someone or helping out and we say, wow, I want to be more like that person. I want to behave more like that. We just learn from the lesson, a positive lesson. I call it the law of to be or not to be. Because we're either learning how we want to be or how we don't want to be. And so I submit to you today, as we open the book, every time we open the book, when we open the book, when the book is open, there are lessons for us. You know, and God's Word is alive and active, and He hits the nail on the head every time. Because it is alive and active. The problem is, is I continue to put my thumb between the nail and the hammer because I don't want to submit to the, oh, what the Word is saying. You see, I want to get in the way. I don't want to yield. I don't want to learn or I don't want to obey the command that God is speaking to me through His Word. So the problem isn't the book. Most of the time the problem is with me. Am I willing to do what God is calling me to do? Let's pray. Father, we thank You. That your word is true and that your word has lessons for us. That you have so much for us in the plethora of the scriptures, Lord God. There are so many lessons, so much. 
God, give us ears to hear this morning. Lord, make us what we are not. God, keep us from where we dare not. And give us what we have not this morning, that we would be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we look at Samson's life, I would pray that you would give us eyes to see the lessons we have from this man who is called a hero of the faith. We love you. We bless you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start out with a little insight into the spiritual climate of the nation of Israel during Samson's life first. And that's going to be in Judges chapter 3, starting in verse 7. And the word of the Lord says, So the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served Baals and Asherahs. And therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathamiah. I'm not going to say that one again, so we're just going to say the king. Amen? And so the children of Israel served the king eight years. And when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. And his name was Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And then in verse 11, we see that so the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel the son of Kenaz died. And so what we get a little snip, snippet right here is there's a cycle in there. I don't know if you caught it or not. There's a cycle that's repeated seven times in the book of Judges. And that cycle is that it starts off with the children of Israel doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And which, which usually means they're serving, another, they're serving idols, they're committing harlotries, they're doing other things than what the Lord has commanded them. And then the next step is they've forgotten the Lord and they're doing all their stuff. Then the anger of the Lord is aroused, okay? So the cycle is the Lord gets angry, then he sells them over to their enemies. And so usually, I mean, this time it happens to be the king, and it, but other times it's the Midianites, other times it's the Philistines. There's a whole bunch of people that God uses as tools and instruments in his hand to bring Israel back to their senses. So the cycle continues when they've had enough of being in bondage. This time it just has, so happens it was eight years. So when they've had enough of being in bondage, they cry out to the Lord. And the Lord raises up a deliverer. And then there's rest in the land for, for whatever amount of time until we read again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And that does happen quite often, seven times. It's like a music track where you hit the repeat button by accident and it just keeps going and going and going. And you're like, who turn that song off. It's, almost, it's, like, it's like a NASCAR race. They just keep going around and around and around. Anybody else feel like that? They just keep going around? That's the way the children of Israel are. The leaders are changing. People are dropping out. People are crashing. But they still just keep going around and around on that track. So before we even make it to Samson, I had to ask myself, if there's always a lesson, what is it? And in this, lesson, in this portion of Scripture for me, Maybe it's the same for you, I don't know. For myself, are there cycles of sin in my life that I continue to allow or I continue to choose and they, they continue to be repeated over and over and over and over? Do I continue to keep going back to the same thing? Maybe, maybe it's my walk. Maybe, I'm, maybe I start out strong in the beginning of the week and I'm reading, I'm getting up and I'm spending time with the Lord, but then by the end of the week, Friday, it's a little tough and I'm not doing so well in that. I don't know, that's just, I just see that cycle and I just have to wonder what kind of cycles are running in my life. Amen? I mean, maybe it's we're thinking we're missing out on something out there. Maybe there's something more for us out there. Or maybe we think that we're not getting all that's ours or all that we deserve. And we continually take these paths that lead us away from the Lord rather than the closer to Him. We keep making these decisions that keep reaping consequences that hurt not only ourselves, but others. Because don't be mistaken, our sin is not our own. It does not just affect us, it affects others. Samson's sin affected others, and it affects us. His sin brought a painful death for his wife and her father. Our sin brings hurtful consequences to us and to others. But do not despair. I have an app for that. Amen? Amen. 
In Judges chapter 3, verse 9, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them. And it's Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. And I want to focus in on that first verse, that first part of the verse. What does it say? When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. That's our joy. That's our hope. That's our, that's our place of refuge. That's our place of redemption. Because no matter how badly we've dropped the ball, we can always cry out to the Lord. We can always turn back to the God of the living. You see, in the days of the judges, God raised up men to deliver. But in these last days, God has raised up a deliverer, the man Christ Jesus. He is our advocate. He is our mediator, our anchor, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we can cry out to him and he will deliver us because he is our hope. My hope is in him because I know what this flesh does and I know what this flesh wants to do and I know how it wants to act. And if you're not, if I'm not careful, I'm looking just a lot like Samson as we're going to see in a little while. And so let's dig into Samson in chapter in Judges chapter 13 verses one through five, we read. Now again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now you are barren and have borne no children. Excuse me, but you shall bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink. Do not eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So right away, we see that his birth is supernaturally announced. I don't know about you, but this struck me because have you ever noticed that God does this quite often, actually? He did it with Abraham and Sarah. The angel of the Lord came and told Abraham they were going to have Isaac. And we start to see that scarlet thread of redemption running through the Old Testament being coming about. Amram and Jochebed, Moses, was born to them and he was, deliver he was the deliverer. He was a promised deliverer as well. Elkanah and Hannah... She dedicated Samuel to the Lord at an early age, but she had that supernatural baby given, and the Lord heard her prayers. Even Zacharias and Elizabeth were born John the Baptist, who was the announcer of Christ. And let's not forget our Savior, Joseph and Mary, were uh, given the announcement of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And so we see that God has a way of doing things that are a little bit different than ours, right? I mean, I'm sure uh, if you think about it and you look at it, babies are frail and they're fragile and they need constant care to grow and to mature. Talk about God using the weak things of the world to confound the wise. He takes a little baby and he uses it for his honor and his purpose and his glory. What a blessing children are. And what a blessing that our God chooses to use them in such an honoring way. I mean, if it was, it's probably like this with the people. God... We need a deliverer. God says, God? Oh, sorry. I blew it. God says, here, have a baby. So the people are asking for a deliverer, and God says, here, have a baby. What a, what a great way. Talk about his ways being totally different than our ways. He doesn't work like we do. It's a vivid reminder also that God is patient. He's patient. He's not in a hurry. He, he, he's going to deliver his people. He, he births a baby. He births the deliverer. His plan is not like our plan. His timetable is his own and not ours. And, that, and so we can draw strength from that, knowing that maybe that thing I'm in right now, it's on his timetable. It may not be on mine, but it's on his. What does that look like? I don't know. But I can rest assured knowing that he is attentive and that he is listening and that he is working because he's always working. You see me, I'm a microwavian. Okay. That means a micro generate microwave generation. I'm 
I'm coining a new word today. We'll see if it hits the Urban Dictionary. I'm the kind of guy that says, give me what I want, when I want it, and give it to me now. And if truth be told, I think a lot of us are like that. God, give me patience now. We, we think that we should, we're supposed to have it. We think we're supposed to do this. But God's not in a hurry. God's going to fulfill his plan. He's been faithful throughout the Old Testament. I have no doubts that he's going to be faithful for the rest until the end of the age. And that's where we can draw, and that's why we draw peace, because we know he's in control. I don't have to be. All I have to do is hold on for the ride. So let's visualize for a moment the woman here who's going to birth Samuel, uh, Samson. She was barren and she had probably given up all hope of ever having a child. I mean, she's up, probably up in age. Well, what a light of hope must have been sparked at that angel's word. You're going to have a son. Man. Even his name speaks of that hope. His name is Brightness or Sunny. Oh, the dreams that must have stirred in this woman at the thought of a son. Because there's so much life and potential in babies. There's so much hope that we can put in. Parents often put huge hopes in their children. I mean, and then he was a judge. He was going to be a judge of Israel at that. What kind of uh, proud and expectant mother this mo woman must have been at the announcement of the angel. You know, as I thought about this, I find it a sad, a sad testimony that our society today, by and large, has this mindset that unborn babies are nothing more than nuisances and intrusions upon their lives and the way of, their way of life, rather than taking them for what they are and, and recognizing that they're miraculous and blessings and full of life and potential. Lord, help us in that area. So much life out there that we waste as human beings. So the next thing we notice about Samson is he was a Nazarite. And so a Nazarite is, comes from the Hebrew word that means to separate or to consecrate. So Nazarites were persons who for a stated period of time would consecrate themselves to the Lord in a special way. They would make a special vow. They would abstain from drinking wine and strong drink and they avoided touching dead bodies Basically, anything that would defile them, they abstained from. And as a mark of their consecration, they allowed their hair to grow. And so what we see is that Samson wasn't a Nazarite by choice, but he was a Nazarite from his birth, just like John the Baptist. And so this, this is a special use. God's using Samson for special purposes. I mean, if we look some, at some of the great feats that he's recorded in the book of Judges, we will find that he killed a lion with his bare hands. And now I'm, I'm just giving you a, a small snapshot of what this is. I encourage you to go back later and read chapters 13 through 16 because they're so rich with lessons for us. They're so rich with the story of how God used this man, how God intervened in his life. So all I'm doing is giving us a snapshot. And so we see that he killed a, bear lion, a lion with his bare hands. We see that he slayed 30 Philistines in anger after losing the riddle. He caught 300 foxes, or maybe a better translation is jackals, but he would, and tied torches to their tails and cut them loose in the grain so they could burn up all the grain. He broke bonds after being tied up numerous times, at least four times that we know of. He slayed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey in, verse, in chapter 15. He broke the gates and pulled it up by its gate post and everything in the city of Gaza in chapter 16. And his last feat, he destroyed the Philistine temple in verse 30 of chapter 16. So we see that Samson was a man of great strength and he was a man that was able to do things. But he was also a man of failures. You see, he wanted to sleep with the enemy. He wanted to marry a Philistine woman in, the, in Timnah, which violated God's law not to marry the Gentiles. The Israelites were supposed to be separated unto that. And not only, even on top of that, though, he was actually a Nazarite. So he had taken it a step further. His, his vow was a little bit further. He was a man controlled by his lusts. 
In chapter 14 of 3, that woman from Timnah, Samson said, when he saw her, she is right in my eyes. And that's really kind of a sad testimony, right? Because he's looking at her, he's looking at what he saw, he hasn't even met the girl yet. And he's saying, she is pleasing to me. In other words, she's easy on the eyes. Woo! That's what he's saying. And so we see that he's, he's breaking his vows by walking in a vineyard in, in, in Timnah. When he's walking, he's in the vineyard. He veered off the road. He went into the vineyard, which was kind of a crazy thing that I didn't catch at first, but he's in a vineyard. He's supposed to be abstaining or staying away from strong drink, grapes, and all these other things. And here he is walking in a vineyard. So it's like he's testing the waters. He's testing the vow. I wonder if the lion was a warning. What are you doing over here, Samson? Could have been a warning from God. I mean, he went into a prostitute in Gaza in Judges chapter 16. He was driven by what he wanted to do, when he wanted to do it, why he wanted to do it, and how he wanted to do it. So not only did he touch a dead body, violating his vow, he also ate honey out of that body. Talk about really thumbing your nose at the vow that you're supposed to be supposed to have taken. He failed to lead his people. Now there's some debate on this because there's not, we did, as we read in chapter 13, we never seen that the children of Israel cried out for a deliverer this time. And also it says that he would begin to deliver his people, Israelites. So there's some debate, but I don't think he ever rallied the troops to fight a battle for the Lord. As a matter of fact, none of his battles were because of the enemies of the Lord, according to what I read. Everything he did was for revenge. It was his own personal stuff. He was reaping consequences of choices he made, and he would get angry, and he would go out and he slayed 30 men. He, he got angry, and he did this. This happened, and he did this. You see, he was taking his own private feuds out, and he was using the tools and the gifts of the Lord for his own gain. I got kind of bummed out with that, because that's kind of heavy. Because if I use, well, how am I using my gifts? How are we using our gifts? They're not ours. He said we were bought with a price. They're not our own. And so, another lesson. God speaking to us again. Utilize the tools that are from the Lord for the business of the Lord. Amen? Now today in our society, a lot of people would say, Oh, these are some small things. Samson was just being free, spirited, and living his life. Come on, why are you about dog judging him and dogging him? But the reality is that especially in our world today, that's known for its appetites, its pleasure seeking, and it's the all about me attitude. We have to remember that it's the small compromises. It's the little foxes that destroy the vineyard. Solomon said that. And what that basically means is that the little compromises do just as much harm as the big ones. I don't have to go out there and be blatant. I can be sneaky and nobody knows and nobody sees. And that compromise does just as much harm as the big ones that everybody sees. So we have to watch the small compromises. We have to be on guard for those little things that say, Oh, it's just one. Oh, it's just a little. Oh, it's that. I don't know. It's not. Because as we see with Samson, he progressed. He got closer and closer until finally he tells Delilah the secret of his strength. The little compromises led to the big, fat, juicy one that cost him. And it cost him dearly. And when we don't beware, when we're not aware, it could cost us as well. You see, I would say for all intents and purposes, it seems to me as if Samson regards his vow as a joke. Even joking about it and mocking at it in the form of a riddle. Out of the eater came something to eat and out of something strong came something sweet. He's mocking and riddling about breaking his vow. He took some stuff that he wasn't supposed to be touching. 
he wasn't supposed to be getting near to or close to. And now he's making riddles about it and he's joking about it. Some might even say he's tempting God. Seeing how far he can go. You see, he lived like everything was owed to him. God, you called me. This is your deal. I can give me the right to do whatever I want. Privileged. I'll do what I want, and I'll do it when I want, and I'll do it how I want. Can somebody say he's spoiled rat? I don't know. His behavior continues in chapter 16 when he finds a woman, probably a Philistine, but we're not told, and she's in the valley of Sorek, and he loves this woman. Her name is Delilah. And so he's carrying on with her, and the Philistines realize he's there, and, he's, and they approach her, and they say, hey, We'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver, each one of us, to find out where his great strength lies. You know, that question befuddled me a little bit because I'm wondering, was he this big, strong-looking dude? Because if he's big and strong, they're going to say, man, that dude's strong, right? He's going to look the part. But they're trying to figure out where his strength is coming from. So I have to wonder, was he this big old hokey dude? I don't know doesn't tell us but it makes sense that maybe he wasn't which would testify all the more to the power of God in his life you see when they look at us and they go that dude's teaching that dude's doing this how much more of a testimony is that to the power of the living God than if we were schooled and we had plaques on the wall and we, were, and we got all, and we got all the qualifications Remember, God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. And so, another thing that I find is this, as she's going about, she's asking him these three times, and three times he's lying to her, and he told her falsely that what she could do to bind him. First she told him, put, she told, he told her to put bow ropes. And then she says, okay, and she put fresh seven bow ropes, and then she said, the Philistines are after you, and he broke them. And she's, she's like, You're, you don't love me, you're lying to me. And so he tells her the next time with new ropes. And so she binds him with new ropes and he falls asleep and she says, Bill, these are on you. And I have to wonder, what was he thinking as she keeps saying this every other day or however time has elapsed? The Philistines are on you. The Philistines are on you. I'd have to start wondering what was happening. I mean, then you notice that as he's going, he's, he's, he hasn't really gotten close to the, the truth of where his strength lies, but the next one, he gets a little closer. Hey, weave my hair into the beam of the web on the loom, and I'll be as weak as any other man. And so you can see his compromise. He's starting to get a little closer. Now he's really actually talking about what he thinks is the source of his, hair, his strength. And you know, I found another sad testimony in this. Sorry, it's a sad day for me. <laughs> but the sad testimony was that four times she asked him where his strength was. And he had the opportunity four times to say, it's the Lord my God. I want to be mindful that when people ask that I'm giving God the glory because it's all about him. I tried to do all my stuff on my own for 18 years. I tried to break free from the drugs, from all that stuff, and I never was able. So when people ask me, and they say, oh, you did good for yourself. No. He did it. Because it wasn't me. Because I couldn't. Because only He can. Because He is our deliverer. And so I find that a little sad, but it's encouraging for us because we have a lesson here not to forget to give God the glory. Amen? Amen. So she's undone. She's at her wit's end. She just keeps pestering him and pestering him now. She's, in, she's vexing his soul to death, the Bible says. And finally, he tells her that the truth. And he tells her that no temptation has ever touched his head. I'm sorry, razor. Temptation is in the next sentence. So no razor has ever touched his head. And so what a vivid picture of how temptation works in our life. It comes knocking and we spurn it. 
It comes knocking again, and we say, hey, Shale, we don't want any. It comes knocking again, and we're like, no way, man. Until that one day when it comes knocking, and we're at a different point in our life, and hey, let me open the door and just see what it looks like. I don't know about you, but I find it best just to say, Jesus, could you please get the door? Because the minute we open the door, those small foxes tear us up. Man. Those small temptations, those small things, those small compromises, it's just a little bit. It's only this, it's only that. And so now what I want to do is I want to read a, the last section of, of Judges chapter 16. So if you want to turn there so we can read along, we're going to start in verse 18. It's a little unorthodox, I know we're going to read towards the end of the message little portion of scripture, but I want us to take a look at this and I really want to see us, I want us to see it from the word for ourselves. And starting in verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, he sent and called for the lords of the Philistines saying, come up once more for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and thought the, brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for the man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. We haven't heard that before, have we? So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before, as other times, and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the, Lord, then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, and they brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. And now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their God and to rejoice. And they said, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, for they said, Our God has delivered into our hands our enemy, the destroyer of our land, and the one who multiplied our dead. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. And Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me fill the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching while Samson performed. And then Samson called out to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the middle, the two middle pillars which supported the temple, and he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might, and the temple fell on the lords and the people who were in it, so that the dead that he killed at his death were more than he killed in his life. And his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtal in the tomb of his father Manoah. And he judged Israel for 20 years. Wow. I don't know about you, but that's pretty, a pretty tragic story. An end to a tragic life. I mean, he had started out with so much promise. His mother was probably elated as we discussed and we looked at. He was called by God. He was set apart. Yet he was so unused. His life was so unfulfilled. Because he was constantly enticed and controlled by his lusts. He was, he was constantly enticed, controlled and betrayed by the women that he thought he loved. And he probably did. And I thought it was a sad testimony. When we look in verse 21 of that passage, it says the Philistines took him and put his eyes out and brought him down to Gaza and they bound him with bronze fetters and he became a grinder in the prison. 
And this verse really stood out to me because our sin will always blind us, bind us, and grind us. There's no way around it. That's the end result of our sin. It, it tears us up inside. It binds us. We can't do the things of the Lord. We can't move because our sin is binding us. We don't want to go because the, the enemy's plaguing us with, you call yourself a Christian? You see, our sin, and truth be told, Samson was probably blind way before this, spiritually speaking. He was definitely bound by his passions. And now he's a grinder in the prison. His choices, his lust, his desires, they all took him on paths that led away from God rather than closer to God. I keep, say, I keep seeing that in this passage. And so there must be something here because if I'm not careful, I'm going to be taking paths that will lead me away from rather than closer to so I don't know about you. I want to be close. I want to be like John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. I want to be found resting in his bosom. I want to be found resting in him and not in my own strength. You see, our sin always takes us further than we want to go. It always keeps us longer than we want to stay. And it always costs us more than we want to pay. I mean, if you think about it, he was 40 miles from home. He's in Gaza. It took him way far out. It keeps us longer. Now he's bound in prison. He can't go. He's going to stay there. He doesn't have the freedom to take off and go back home now. And he definitely, I guarantee you, did not want to give up his eyes. Nor did he want to give up his life. So while Samson is a tragic story of what could have been, it is also a story of great hope, a story of redemption. At least we always focus on the negative or the lessons that I can learn from the negative. We need to look at the hope that lies within this passage because this hope, while Samson suffered some pretty harsh consequences for his choices, there's a couple of words that I really loved in verse 22. However, you could almost have put, but God. Because God wasn't done with Samson. In verse 22 we read that however the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. So Samson may have been bleeding, broken, and busted, but God had not left him. God had not forsaken him. Look at verse 28. You see Samson has the app and he knew that he could call out to the Lord. And so we read in verse 28, Samson called to the Lord saying, O oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. What a great lesson for us today. I don't care where you're at, what situation you're in. Remember me, O oh Lord, I pray. That is a great promise for us. That is a great truth for us. You see, Samson by faith called on the name of the Lord. It reminds me of that prayer of the thief on the cross Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom you see that is faith that is recognizing that the Lord is king the Lord it is the Lord that is God not we ourselves you see there's something about coming to the end of oneself one's resources one's strength that helps put things in perspective and that's probably why more times than not we learn from losing everything because when we got it all, <laughs> we don't need to trust in that. God, do we? Look what I got. Look what I'm doing. Lord, remember me, I pray. You see, Samson, may, some may call him a failure. Some may call him a hero. But the Bible calls him a man of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 through 34, the writer says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, 
quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. You see, the Bible says that the things he did was by faith. And at the very last, I guarantee you that when he called on the Lord, he was calling in faith, believing that God would do what he said he would do. So what does all this mean to us and how do we sum it all up? There was a lot. I didn't even talk about that sad scripture that said that he did not know the Lord had departed from him. That's a sad scripture. That's a sad day when you're walking around and you look like you're doing everything right, but you don't even know the Lord has departed. So I find here, and so I wrestled with this, and I, I had to look at it, and I had to find it, and I had to tussle with it, because, but what I found is a picture set before Israel, for them, but also for us. Paul said it's for us today. And that picture is on the one hand, we can see the weakness of walking in our own ways, of walking in our own desires, leaning on our own understanding, trusting in our own strength. That's what Samson did a lot. He did that a lot. But on the other hand, we get to see the great strength that may be acquired to overcome our strongest enemies, our greatest weaknesses, through faithful submission to the Lord. So Samson's life is a picture and showing us how not to walk and how to walk. We see in his in Samson's actions, this constant testing of the waters, this deviation from what one would consider acceptable Nazarite behavior. In other words, he, he, when you think of Nazarite, everybody would know he was a Nazarite because he has the hair. We know he's supposed to be set apart from God, but look how he lives. We see this same exact behavior in the children of Israel. They're testing God with their idols, their idolatries, and their harlotries with the other nations around them. They're marrying and intermarrying with the nations. Their behaviors were not those of a nation that had been delivered by the strong arm of the Lord. Yeah, the Lord delivered us. Wow, you sure live funny for having that truth in your life. Which brings us to another lesson. Because I always want to bring it right down here. I want to bring it right here where it's personal for me. I want to apply it to me first. So I have to ask, as we probably should all ask, does my life reflect the acceptable behaviors of a follower of Jesus Christ? That's a tough one. Am I living what I say I believe? Samson lived according to the ways of the world around him, and if we're not careful, we'll do the same. He walked around with that symbol of belonging to the Lord, and he lived a rough life. He looked like something he was not, and if we're not careful, we can do the same. Oh, she reads her Bible. Oh, he goes to church. Yeah, but look at the way he lives. Look at the way she talks. Have you ever heard that? You see, if the inner reality does not match the outer appearance, we're, we're in trouble. Then the rubber's not hitting the pavement. There's a disconnect. And it will bleed out, and others will see it, and we will defame the name of our God rather than giving him glory. But again, we're back to that hope thing because there's still hope because we can fix it. We downloaded the app. We have the app and we know that we can call out to the Lord no matter where we're at. And just to help you get that app up and running, and I got a few scriptures here for you. Psalm 91, 15, He shall call upon me and I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble and I will deliver him and I will honor him. Those are words from the Lord God Almighty. And those are words for us that we can take to heart. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And in Jeremiah 29, 12 through 14, it says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will bring you back from your captivity. See, the hope is, is that no matter where we are today, while we have breath, we have the opportunity to call out to the living God to rescue us, to save us, to redeem us, to pull us from the place that we are at, to give us the strength to say no. To give us the strength to flee. To give us the strength to come out from amongst the unclean things and walk according to His ways. That is our hope. That is our redemption. It's in the Lord. It's not in our power. It's not in our strength. It's not in our abilities. Because everything we have comes from the Lord. And just to be clear, we do not have to wait until our lives are falling apart to use this app. I don't have to wait till I've lost it all to cry out to the living God. We can do that today. And He will pull us from whatever we need to be. He will strengthen us and He will take care of us. Father, we thank You for this Word, Lord God. And Lord, what an astounding promise that we find at the book, at the end of a tragic life, Lord God, in the book of Judges. Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us and that when we call upon your name, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You are faithful and you are just to not allow us to be tempted beyond what we may bear. You are faithful and just and we are reminded today, Lord God, that you do not put to shame those who call upon your name. Thank you, God for these great truths. We thank you. We love you. I pray that you would seal these words in our hearts, in our minds, and that our heart and our mind would connect and that we would walk these truths out. That we would do this and not that. That we would, to be or not to be would be our question, Lord God. That we would know that we want to be for you. And that we would think about the things that we're doing. In Jesus' name, amen.